you live, and thank you for all those listening uh, listening by podcast later on. We're also on uh, Facebook Live for those of you who uh, who uh, have access to computer and want to see live video of this, although uh, you don't get to see anything you can't hear, right? All right, today uh, we're going to take a break a little bit, at least for a portion of this, uh, in order to, uh, and uh, from politics and from talking about Donald Trump. I'm a little sick of the whole topic, um, but uh, and we're going to talk about something more fundamental, something more philosophical, and then maybe try to bridge it into politics. Uh, and uh, we're going to talk about selfishness and what selfishness means and. Uh, why, uh, you know, what Ayn Rand means by the whole concept of selfishness, and we can talk about all the ways in which this is misunderstood and all the ways in which uh, the whole idea of selfishness is distorted in the popular culture, and even among people who claim to be supportive of uh, our ideas. So I want to, that's where I'll bring in some of the politics, because I, I think it's really important to talk about selfishness. And I'm using the word selfishness on purpose right now, um, for the same reason I ran it, because it, it makes some people uncomfortable. Um, self-interest, uh, selfishness, but I want to talk about how it's applied or misapplied in, in the debate in politics. And in this context, maybe we can talk about towards the end of the show about robots. Robots, you know, robots going to replace all that manual labor, that horrible manual labor that we all... Um, that we all have to do, I don't know, people have to work in factories and uh, cleaning the house and driving your car. And soon, soon, all of that is going to be handled on um, by a robot, by artificial, so-called artificial intelligence. It's not exactly intelligence, it's the human beings that are the, the intelligent, but the computer, the computer becomes almost um, mimics, in a sense, some human processes. So you don't have to drive a car, and you don't have to drive trucks, and traffic accidents drop dramatically. And uh, you can go on and on and all the benefits of robots. But some would argue because we should be selfish, and uh, and since robots are going to affect my job, actually my job is pretty safe. Robots can't do what I do. But, you know, a lot of your jobs are going to be affected. You should be against robots, and indeed, indeed uh, Bill Gates has come out and said we should tax robots, and we'll talk about why he's saying this, where does this come from, uh, what, is, what drives somebody like Bill Gates to say something like, let's tax robots, what, 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 is, what is happening here? And, and I want to talk in that context also about the role of philosophy and the role of ideas and the role of morality in these political debates. How is that, how is morality shaping what Bill Gates is saying about uh, about robots, because it's all about it's all about philosophy. I mean, I, I got a lot of posts saying, "Oh, Bill Gates is doing that because he's so rich, and uh, because uh, y- you know he's made it, and uh, his startups don't have to make any money. Who cares?" As if life is about all life is about is material values. All life is about is money, which is a typical Marxist view. It's a typical leftist view, but fast life is not primarily about money and therefore to evaluate other people's behavior, to measure things, to measure things in terms of uh, their effect on money alone or as a primary is a massive mistake and unselfish as we'll see as we go along today. All right, uh, really important I'd love for you guys to call in uh, with questions about this topic, but let's stick to selfishness, self-interest, morality uh, for the first 45 minutes or so. So feel free to call in 347-324-3075. Any questions you have about uh, Ayn Rand's view of morality, about self-interest, what self-interest means, about selfishness, about misunderstandings about it, misconceptions you might have or people you know might have or how to explain it better, um, you know, let's let's really take this opportunity to dig deeper into this and to dig deeper into uh, what what you find as confusing or what you find as difficult in uh, in this idea of being selfish or being self interested and 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 you know how to explain it or how to live it. More importantly, much more importantly, 
much, much, much more importantly, how to live it. What does it mean for you, for your life, to be selfish and how to apply it? All right, so you can call in 347-324-3075. And just to remind you, you have to press the one, I think, in order to let me know that you want to ask a question, that you're not just dialing in to listen in, because some people do that. They just dial in just to listen to the show over the phone, which you can do at 347-324-3075. But you can also ask a question using that number. So go for it. All right. Great. We're on Facebook Live. I think everybody, everything's working fine on Facebook Live. Everything's working fine on Block Talk Radio in spite of the fact that I thought there were some problems, still think there might be. Uh, Everybody seems to be happy. So, cool. Um, What do we mean by self-interest? What is is the, when we talk about uh, selfishness, there's so much confusion about selfishness, right? What what does Ayn Rand, what do we as objectivists, or uh, those of us who are objectivists mean when we talk about self-interest? Well, first of all, This is a concept in morality. Morality is that field that studies, right? Studies the values and virtues uh, that that are fundamental for life, that shape your life, that shape your character. So, you know, morality is about general truths that are chosen. Morality is chosen and fundamental to shape your character and life. And the question is, what should be the standard by which one makes decisions that are important? What, what should be the standard? Standard answer always has been uh, one of a number. One is just follow orders. You don't have to worry about this too much. Follow the commandments. Choose to follow the commandments, right? We got 10 commandments. We got 624, something like that different prescriptions by the Jewish faith on what you should do in every aspect of your life. Christianity has something similar. Islam has something similar. Judaism and and Islam, I think, are more comprehensive in terms of covering, actually giving you guidelines, instruction manuals on almost every aspect of your life and what to do and what not to do. In that sense, Judaism and and, uh, Islam are very similar in in that respect. So that's one option. It's just follow orders. And, and basically, where do the orders come from? They come from God. And it's not about, it's, it's, it's just you living for the sake of God by following these orders. The alternative to that has always been, no, you should live by your own choices, by your own decisions. And the standard for those choices and those decisions, the moral standard for those choices and decisions, should be other people's lives the well-being of the group, the well-being of the majority, the well-being of the tribe, the well-being of somebody else. And you have to figure out what that means or you can just follow the guidelines of, I don't know, the dictator, the, the, the philosopher king, the fewer, whoever, who will tell you what's good for the group and you just have to follow orders. I mean, both moral alternatives usually revert to follow orders. But of course, there are, 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 you know, alternatives to that, which tend to be, well, you figure out what's good for other people. Morality deals primarily with what to do with other people, how to behave towards other people. And generally, morality tells you that other people's lives are more important than yours. And therefore, sacrifice is the moral standard and being selfless and helping other people and focusing on other people and sacrificing for other people and other people are the focal point of morality. And as we'll see, when we get to Bill Gates' article, that really, that morality is really underpins the whole thrust of what he's arguing. He's not making an economic argument. He's not making a, a, a tax policy argument, really. He's fundamentally making a moral argument. He's making a moral argument from the perspective of altruism, the idea, otherism, the idea that others are the primary focus the primary, and particularly which others? Well, those that need your help, those that have a need. So it's the weak, it's the poor, it's the meek, it's the suffering. It's anybody who has a need is the other for which you need a sacrifice, for which you need to be selfless 
and and this animates Bill Gates's proposal. This is what drives Bill Gates's proposal. Right? So it's need that drives this. All right. Now, if you want a really, um, if you want a really good uh, discussion of altruism and how it plays out in politics and how it plays out in the whole political debate, then I really recommend to you Peter Schwartz's uh, book on uh, in defense of selfishness, uh, which I think is the title. I'll check on Amazon in a second and and uh, let you know. But um, it, it, Peter Schwartz's book is excellent on particularly on this point of describing what altruism really means and then on showing how altruism is used politically across the board in everything, right? And this is at the end of the day, I'll just make this political point quickly. This is at the end of the day why I think it matters. It does not matter who the president is. It doesn't matter who runs Congress. It doesn't matter what they say and their best intentions and they're all free market people and, and uh, you know, uh, uh, Donald Trump wants to shrink government and reduce regulations and he wants to cut taxes and do away with Obamacare and all these things. All of that doesn't matter. They cannot do it. They cannot do it. Why? Why can't they do it? Why can't they do it? Because the animating factor, the animating factor in, um, in our world today, the animating moral factor in our world, world today is altruism. And you're not going to be able to eliminate all those government programs. You're not going to be able to get rid of Obamacare and really replace it with free market medicine without challenging the fundamental premise of altruism. And the same thing is true with regard to deregulation. The same thing is true with regard to really cutting taxes in a meaningful way. The same thing is true with any free market program. It cannot be done even if you believe that the politicians of the world have the best intentions in the world. They can't do it. They won't be able to convince the American people. Even the American people have the best intentions of the world. They're not going to get, you know, it was that famous sign uh, that, they, that the Tea Party held up. Keep your hands off of my Medicare. You know, you can't touch Medicare. Oh, my God. What will old people do? They'll suffer. They'll die. They're throwing mother, grandmothers off the cliff. Conditions. And what about children? And what about babies? And what about this? And what about that? There's no end to it. Right? All right. The, the book, In Defense of Selfishness. Why the code of self-sacrifice is unjust and destructive. If you want to understand the mechanism by which altruism animates every single one of our political decisions today, this is the book to read. And, and I know a lot of you have not read it because I know, uh, because I know the, the sales figures and a lot of you listening to this need to get this book, In Defense of Selfishness by Peter Schwartz. I also recommend The Virtue of Selfishness by Ayn Rand, of course. And... Uh, you know, there's a chapter in um, in the Companion to Ayn Rand. Now, it's a very, very expensive book, so I hate to, uh, but it is brilliant. Uh, it is a brilliant book, and uh, edited by Greg Sully Mary and Alan Godhelf. It's called The Companion to Ayn Rand. Excellent book. Everybody again should buy it. It's 129 bucks, although you can get the Kindle edition for 32 dollars. Um, but uh, Greg Salamir is an excellent chapter in that book as well on, on this whole issue of egoism and altruism. Um, all right. So, yeah, I mean, The Companion is brilliant, so you should definitely get it. So those are three book recommendations. In Defense of Selfishness by Peter Schwartz, um, Virtue of Selfishness, of course, by Ayn Rand, and The Companion to Ayn Rand. And, of course, you should buy all of my books. Um, uh, when he, uh, which one is this one? This one is, would be uh, Free Market Revolution. Uh, deals with uh, some of these issues uh, as well. So Free Market Revolution is another book all of you should really have. Like it's, These books are essentials in your library. And look, you cannot understand objectivism. And I, I'd, I'd love to run a poll. I'm going to run a poll on Twitter or Facebook to, to find out how many of the people who follow me have actually read Ayn Rand's nonfiction, read Opa, uh, Virtue of Selfishness, Capitalism, the Unknown Ideal, 
read some of the other books, like Peter Schwartz's book, some of my books, but, but how many have actually read the literature, the actual writings on objectivism? I, I mean, pretty much everybody's read Atlas Shrugged and the Fountainhead, I assume, although some of you I know have not, but most of you have. Uh, but how many of you read the nonfiction? And, and let me tell you, you cannot understand objectivism. You don't know objectivism. And please, I don't think you should call yourself an objectivist unless you have read and actually studied those books and, and, and know what Ayn Rand is actually referring to. All right. So fundamental to Ayn Rand is this idea, to, 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 uh, to the objectivist ethics is the idea that man's life, your life, every individual's life is the standard of value for that individual. So morality is about your life. It's about making your life the best that it can be. It's about figuring out more than that, right? It's about figuring out how to live. And, and this is the, I think, really interesting original point that Ayn Rand makes, right? Life is conditional. We can die or we can live. And dying is not just a minor issue. Dying is going out of existence. So we can exist or we can not exist. We can be alive or not be alive. That every living being faces this basic alternative, life or non-existence. And that for human beings, this is a non-trivial choice. Because as conceptual beings, because we have free will, because we have reason, because we are fundamentally conceptual, we do not have life inscribed into our genes. We do not have the blueprint for how to live, how to live well, how to succeed in life inscribed into our genes. We have to figure all that out for ourselves. It's because of the unique form of our consciousness. Most, all other animals have to some degree or another it inscribed. They know exactly what to do. It's pro pre-programmed. Everything comes pre-programmed. How to survive, how to live, how to be a cheetah, how to be a lion, how to be a plant. It's all pre-programmed. It's all inscribed. You know what to do. Human beings are not like that. Human beings have to figure it out to live as a human being, to survive as a human being. Everything, everything from finding food on a scale appropriate to human beings, like agriculture, or large-scale hunting, or any, any form of significant nutrition for human beings, has to be figured out, has to be reasoned, has to be thought through, has to be discovered. So for human beings, the choice to live, the choice to live is not, once you make that choice, once you make that choice, there's still a lot of work to do. Animals can't make the choice. They automatically have life turned on. And then they know exactly what to do about it. Human beings have to make the choice to live and then have to figure out how to do it. And the figuring out how to do it, the figuring out what to do, what things are good for you and what not to good for you, that is about choosing values, what I should seek, what I should go out and gain and keep, what I should hold on to, right? what I should go out there and pursue. That human beings have to choose. Now, but all in the context of life. First, you have to choose life. And then the question arises, well, what do I do in order to survive? I need food. How do I get food? And that's not obvious. None of that is obvious, right? How to get food. So 
Hi, ultimately, how do I get clothes? How do I get how, fire? Ooh, fire is very useful for my existence, for my living life as a human being. So for, for objectivism, life, your existence, your existence as a human being, qua human being, is the standard of all value. Fire, good, bad, good. It helps me cook. It gives me light. It helps me defend myself. Bad. It can burn me. But the standard, notice the standard of why it's good and why some things are bad. It's bad to the extent that it threatens my life. It can burn me. It can kill me. It's good to the extent that it enhances my life. Cook. Light. Self-defense. So man's life is the standard of value for objectivism. And to some extent, implicit, before you get a corruption of ethics, to some extent, implicit in man's behavior is this seeking out life, trying to make a better life for yourself. So we discover fire way, way before we discover ethics. And yet, like other animals, we are seeking to live, to survive, to succeed, to make our lives more comfortable, better, happier, ultimately. So for objective as a man's life is a standard of value and happiness or flourishing or living life to the fullest as a human being is our purpose, is the purpose. Right? Now, what does that require? What does it require? So if your life is the standard, what's the next step? What is the most important value you should pursue? What are the virtues that are most important to you? Now, as I mentioned, it's not self-evident, not self-evident what kind of life you should live. It's not self-evident what values you should pursue. It's not self-evident what kind of behaviors are going to lead to a good life or not. Why? Because it's, life's complicated. It's complex. It's long. We, particularly today, we live to be 80, 90 years old. What kind of actions, what kind of values are going to make my life a good life over the next, well, I'm not going to live another 80 years, so I'm going to live, let's say, ah, let's say 40. Let's be generous, right? What kind of actions that I do today, what effect are they going to have over the next 40 years of my life? What is going to enhance that life? What is going to make that life miserable? What's going to enhance my existence? What's going to make me a better person? What's going to allow me to live a better, more fulfilling, more successful, more flourishing life? And what is not? That's hard. And we have the ability as human beings to see not just first level consequences, not just to evaluate our emotions, but to look at second level consequences and third level consequences. If I lie, I might get a short term emotional benefit by uh, reducing the level of fear because this person is going to be angry at me. But what are the second level consequences? What does this imply to my relationship with this person? What happens if I ever get caught one day? What happens to my ability to think otherwise, to think about, you know, to use my mind? Does it impact that? We have the ability to look beyond the immediate range of our senses, to think about the future, to estimate the consequences of our actions, to think, to reason. And ultimately conceptualize, and indeed, not only do we have that ability, but that is what makes human life possible. Without that ability, we would die tomorrow. Without the ability to conceptualize, without the ability to reason and think, we would all die tomorrow. We cannot live on our emotions. We cannot live by intuition. We cannot live by instinct. So it's complicated. There are so many levels of consequences. Human life is such a complex, wonderful, amazing, but complex phenomena. To be successful at it is hard. You have to deal with yourself, your own mind, your own knowledge. You have to deal with reality, what's going on around you, with physical reality. And then you have to deal with other people. Talk about complex. Hugely complex. Right? So how do we do it? 
How do we do it? We need guidance. We need guidance in order to be successful. We can't just drift. We need guidance. So where does this guidance come from? Well, it comes from our conceptual ability. It comes from our conceptual faculty. We need guidance in the form of particular types of concepts. And here we need guidance from principles. We need principles. We need general truths that we can rely on, we can, we can depend on, right? And that we know other truths depend on them. So we need to prove to ourselves certain general truths, like honesty is a good strategy in life because lying, deception, uh, faking it to yourself and to others has been proven over and over again to be destructive. I can come up with a general principle that says, you know, trying to achieve a value through dishonest means is bad, and I'm going to be honest from now on, always on principle. I don't have to reprove this over and over again every time I have a conversation with another human being or every time I'm tempted to tell a lie. I just know it's wrong, so I don't do it. Not because it's a commandment, because at some point I proved it to myself. Now, principles are fundamentals reached by induction, by inductive reasoning. So I've seen it, 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 you know, it just doesn't work. It's bad for human life. It's bad for me. And therefore, I form a principle, a moral principle. And of course, we are taught these moral principles. But if you teach them right, you don't teach them as commandments, right, as religion does. You teach moral principles as, look, this is what works if you want to survive. If you want to thrive as a human being, here are the things that work and here are the things that don't work. Here are examples. Often you can use literature or you can use other mechanisms by which to show the dangers of certain actions and the benefits of other actions. Sometimes people actually experience, have to experience it. Sometimes people actually have to lie in order to see that it doesn't work and have to watch other people lie and see it doesn't work for them before they get it, before they get a principle around it. Right? So you need principles. You need principles to help guide your life. You need these fundamentals that are not achieved, reached by revelation, they're not reached from reading a book, even if that book is out of shrugged. They are reached by thinking, by integrating, by the process of induction. So from reality, inducing a principle, and the principle, in this case, a moral principle, that helps guide your actions. So moral principles. These are practical principles. They're supposed to help you live. They're supposed to be earthly, right? They're necessary. They're concerned with living. That's what morality is about. And this is the whole perversion of Christianity and altruism and so on. Christianity, morality is all about suffering, saints. Have you ever seen a happy saint, like sitting on a cross with a smile on his face? No. The whole point of being a saint is that you're suffering, you're miserable, you're, it, it, life is just horrible. That's the point of sainthood. That's what morality is about, according to Christianity, right? Whereas Ayn Rand's morality is about living. It's about the principles that will help you live a successful, flourishing, and ultimately happy life. That's so phenomenal. That is so phenomenal. Right? For the first time really in human history, you know, maybe Aristotle to some extent, here and there people dabbled in this. But for the first time in human history, somebody's come up with a morality whose whole purpose, whose whole purpose is the successful living of individuals whole purpose is to give you tools, to give you tools, 
to live well, ultimately to achieve happiness. And, and that's what Ayn Rand's morality is about. That's what being selfish means. Being selfish is to follow moral principles, requires following moral principles in the attainment of a successful, flourishing, purposeful life. It's, whoops, selfishness, it, it's all, you know, you're concerned as a selfish human being. You should be concerned with the moral principles that lead to life as a human being, to a successful human being. All right, so any questions up to this point? It's pretty abstract today. Uh, 347 324 Three zero seven five, right? So we need moral principles because we don't know automatically what to do. We don't know how to live a good life automatically. We need a we need concepts. We need ideas, and ultimately we need principles because principles are shortcuts. They make it possible for us to think. They're efficiency builders, right? They make it possible to say. I should always be rational. I don't need to figure out in this particular situation whether I should be rational or not. I should just always be rational. And if you think about it, the primary virtue, the primary virtue, and really every other virtue is just an application of this, the primary virtue if you want to live a successful life is thinking. It's rationality. It's think, think, think. Think, think, think. Because all of human life, depends on one's ability to think. It depends on one's ability to reason. To the extent that one is rational, to the extent that one is rational, only to that extent can one be successful in life. So when we look around at Bill Gates or other people and their successes in life, it's because in that at least area within their life, they were rational. They use their reason. They use your mind. You don't get successful lives, really success in, in anything, just from emotion or just from, um, I don't know, intuition. Or, if it's sustained success, it's a consequence of somebody having focused their mind, used it effectively, connected it with real reality, found truths, it's about being rational. It's about being rational. So to be selfish, to be selfish, means to place your own life as a standard of value. It means to live the best life that you can be, to achieve, to attain, to strive towards flourishing and happiness. And the way to do it is by being rational. By applying rationality, by applying the, the thinking to every aspect of your life. And one way to do that is by applying principles. Okay. So being selfish equals being rational. To be rational is to be selfish to the extent that people out there are rational in their lives. That's good. They're doing something that's good for them, even when they don't know it even when they don't know it, right? All right. Um, if you want to ask anything, take the conversation in a different direction. Have I said something that doesn't make any sense or that is too simplistic or too abstract or, yeah, it's hard. No feedback. I'm used to a classroom where I can tell that half the students are falling asleep and I can tell the others kind of are eager to ask a question, and some are just bewildered, and some are getting it, and there's this light in their eye. The problem with doing a podcast is I have no idea what you guys, what you guys are responding. You know, some people are leaving the chat, some people are entering the chat, so I guess the people leaving are the ones who fell asleep, but half of you might be asleep too. Anyway, uh, podcast, I'm just talking to myself. So uh, give a call. And let me know what you think, 347-324-3075, 347-324-3075. You can press a 1, you can press a 1 
um, for uh, to ask a question. To ask a question. All right. So selfishness is about being rational, and it's about stick. It's about identifying the principles that are necessary for human life, for human success, for human thriving, for human flourishing. Now, that's not an easy task. It is an enormous, enormous achievement to recognize those principles. And indeed, it's taken, I don't know, 100,000 years of human life before a philosopher by the name of Ayn Rand came up with those principles. The virtues and the values and the whole system, the whole ethical system that Ayn Rand discovered. That is a massive, massive human history-like achievement. The fact that Ayn Rand's ethical system is not celebrated throughout the land on a regular basis, the fact that Ayn Rand isn't a, as, as celebrated as Thomas Jefferson is in America or George Washington is America, is really, really sad, given how revolutionary and how dramatic and how life-changing the ethical system that Ayn Rand discovered is. I mean, there were always people who lived like this. But they were made to feel guilty for it. And they had no answer when they were made to feel guilty for it in response. So they felt guilty. And indeed, it's one of the great tragedies of human history is that the great achievers were often persecuted, never got the credit they deserved, were condemned. Were condemned for what? For using their mind. Were condemned for what? For being selfish, for being rational. Condemned for what? for taking their life seriously. So for millennia, the best people have been condemned, have been ridiculed, have been put down because of their virtues, because of how good they are, because they've used their mind, because they've been saying, think of how many people have been burnt at the stake through human history because they discovered something new that upset people whether it's an idea or whether it's a product or whether it's, a, it's science. And it's because until Ayn Rand, you could not defend man seeking his own well-being by the use of reason. You know, you, you couldn't defend it against the onslaught of Christianity, against the onslaught of altruism. I mean, there was a brief period... And in, in, in Greece, where the good was celebrated, where man's reason and rationality was celebrated, and maybe a brief period in the Enlightenment, where they had some notion, some idea of, of, of the truth of this. But these are rare moments in human history. Rare moments in human history. And now Ayn Rand has finally given us a philosophy, an ethical code, that justifies thinking, morally, that says that it's the most important thing you can do. And that says that the purpose of your life is to think for the purpose of living a good life. And that those, those who promote your life, those who make your life better, should be rewarded, not punished. They should be admired, not resented. They should be heroes not condemned to the gallows or the crosses or the antitrust regulations or whatever the modern equivalent of the gallows is. So before we get into what, is, what about the poor and what about, um, what about I don't know, what, selfish people treat other people badly, all this garbage, right, all this misconception, all this nonsense, right, Selfish people only think about themselves. That would be bizarre. Before you get to any of that, you got to focus on the positive. What a selfish person is, is a person who cares about himself, is a person who takes his life seriously. It's a person who wants to live the best life that he can live. It's a person who wants to flourish as a human being. And as a consequence, as a consequence, venerates his own reason, views rationality as his primary virtue and seeks to discover 
and constantly use moral principles. Wow, that must be evil. Those selfish bastards. Right? Selfish bastards. They want to be principled and they want to use their mind. Oh my God, what's going to happen? We're all going to die. All right, let's take a call <laughs> before I go nuts. Hi, you're on the Iran Book Show. Who's this? Yeah, hello. Can you hear me? I can. You're breaking up a little bit, but we'll see if we can cope. Hey. Okay, sorry. Yeah. Um, Silver Spastard here. So I just have a quick question for you. Sure. There's people out there that call themselves, they say they're into what they call Islamists, and they believe just in... They're into what? Say that again. They're into what? They call it radical. It means basically just saying what's ever on your mind, however you feel. But you could go up to a total stranger in a restaurant and just tell them. And they feel that if they don't do that, that they don't reveal all the feelings that they're being dishonest. Yeah, yeah. Well, well I think it's... The, your position on honesty with that. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that's it's just silly. I, I, unfortunately, I'm gonna I'm gonna take you off because the, the, whenever whenever I'm dependent on today for some reason the calls and the music that I heard is all is all chopped up and I can't hear it. So I, I so but somebody's helping me on the on the chat because I think um, because I think uh, you guys can probably hear the calls better than I can. Um, so it's called radical yeah radical honesty. This idea of I need to say everything that's on my mind whenever it appears on my mind to whoever is not interested or whatever. I mean, it's just out of context nonsense. It's silly. It's stupid, to put it, to put it uh, simply, right? Honesty has to have a purpose. Everything you do has to have a purpose, and that purpose is guided by what's good for your life long term. So going up to strange and telling him you're ugly serves no purpose. It adds nothing to your life. You, the, you don't owe the stranger anything. They don't owe you anything. You have no relationship. Nobody asked your opinion. It's just rude and, and silly. And again, selfishness is not about emotions. Now, the outcome of being selfish is partially emotional in the sense that you experience happiness partially as an emotion. But it's not about emotions. So just because you feel like, uh, you know, uh, I don't know, I'm sad right now, doesn't even you have to tell the world you're sad. It, 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 again, it has to be motivated by a purpose, by what am I trying to gain? And if it's not furthering your life, then it's a waste of your time. And... You're penalizing somebody else for no reason. It actually hurts your life because you're just upsetting somebody who doesn't deserve to be upset, who hasn't done anything to you. So it's just a silly out of context absolute that ignores the whole purpose of being honest. The whole purpose of being honest is to further your life. The whole purpose of being honest is... To live a flourishing life. Imagine if I, I mean, just imagine the waste of time if I had to go around telling everybody everything that I came into my mind. What a waste of time for me. And, and you know, I wouldn't want to deal with a person like that. And, and uh, as a consequence, people wouldn't want to deal with me and that wouldn't be selfish of me. So it's just, it's just silliness, right? Um, it's just silliness. It, 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 being honest doesn't mean saying Everything that's on your mind. If somebody asks you a question and you think they deserve an answer or you think you, for whatever reason, an answer is forthcoming, then give them an answer and tell them, tell them honestly what your answer is. But there's also the option of saying, I don't want to answer that question. Or, you know, another time or whatever. Get away from you don't You don't even have to answer a question that's being asked for you if answering the question doesn't serve a purpose. Now, the purpose is a long-term purpose. It has to be a rational purpose. It's not about the emotions of the moment. It's not about what's convenient. It's not what, about what feels good. It really is about 
long term, is this good for me or isn't it good for me? In reason, is this good for me or isn't it good for me? All right. So, uh, well, let me see if I can get you back on the line and see if I've answered your question. Does that answer your question? Yeah, that, uh, can you hear me? I kind of, so I can hear every other word, but let's make a, make a try at it. Yeah, I think that's really good. The one thing that always comes up is, like, if you're... And, um, Whoop, you know, I lost you. you. It, it, the one thing that comes up is if... Okay. you're at work, for example, are you obligated to boss about your philosophical leanings or your political No, no. Impact your- no, absolutely not, unless your job is philosophical and political. So again, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put you on, on, on hold. Uh, unless your job relates to that, absolutely not. You have no obligation. Now, I wouldn't lie about it. But you, you say, you know, I'm, I, I don't want to talk about politics at work. That's fine, right? So, um, absolutely not. You don't owe anybody, you know, anything unless you owe them, right? But you have to figure what you owe them depends on the context. But, but there, and there are complexities here, right? I'm not saying this is simple. So we could do a whole show just on honesty because it's so fascinating. But it is, it is complicated. For example... Uh, I, I used to do seminars um, at, at a, um, a tech company on this, and, and honesty used to come up, and, and uh, so they used to ask me this question. Um, you know, if we think there is a problem with a product that is so trivial they have no impact on the performance that the customer needs the product for, are we obligated to give them that information? And if you're really convinced that it will have no impact on the performance, then no, you're not obligated to give them that information unless the contract that you have with that client says else something else, right? But it surely would be dishonest if you know there's a flaw in the product that will affect performance. Then you are obligated to tell them, and you can see why. Because it's in your absolute long-term self-interest to do so, because when it has the impact on the performance of the product, and the customer comes back to you and says, hey, what happened here? Did you know about this in advance? They're never going to deal with you again. They're never going to deal with you again. Okay. So it's really, I mean, lying or, or not lying, um, honesty, it, it can be on a practical level a very complex issue, right? And one has to think about the context one has to think about what is the contract I have with this person. You have a different contract, a different set of obligations towards your wife than towards some stranger. Right? So you, you, you don't have to tell every stranger what's in your mind about, I don't know, the latest life-changing decision you made. But you probably are obligated to your wife if it's truly a wife, a life, I was going to say a wife changing. If it truly was a life changing decision that you make, your life partners, so that there's an obligation there, right? So what you tell to whom, when, and how is all dependent on context, all guided by the principle of honesty, right? So Applying the virtues is not trivial and self-evident. And this I will recommend to you, like I did last week, I think, to read a book. And that book is Objectives in the Philosophy of Ayn Rand. Read Objectives in the Philosophy of Ayn Rand. Read the chapters on the virtues. Read what the virtues actually mean versus what a superficial understanding of the virtues seems to mean. We got to get educated about this philosophy if we're going to change the world. We got to get educated, more importantly, about this philosophy if we want to have the best life that we can live. If we want to live a happy, prosperous, successful, purposeful life, then read the guidebook, read the manual, understand the manual, and then go and apply it every single day, every moment you're alive. Or I should have said, every moment you're awake. Right? So put aside politics. 
Put aside Donald Trump. Put aside what's going on in Congress. Put aside Obamacare. Put aside Muslims. You know what? The Islamic threat is nothing as compared to the threat of not knowing what's good for you, of not knowing the ethical principles of objectivism and letting altruism slip into your thinking. All of that garbage that's happening every day on the news, stop watching it. Take a break. Say for two months, I'm not watching Fox. I'm going to read a section of OPA, OPA, Objectivism and Philosophy of Ayn Rand, and think about it. Now, I also think uh, another book you should be reading about this that also kind of digs deeper into these, chews them, helps you integrate them, helps you really think about it, is a book by Tara Smith. Um, the Virtuous Egoist, I think it's called. Um, so, uh, you know, there's tons of resources now in objectivism, tons of resources to study, integrate this. Forget about politics just for a little bit. You know, the, the, the Trump administration will still be there in three months. The wall will still have not been built in three months. Islamic immigration will still be a topic in three months, really study the virtues because studying the virtues is about living your life. Yeah, so uh, Terry Smith's book is called Ayn Rand's Normative Ethics, The Virtuous Egoist. The Virtuous Egoist. So fabulous book. Again, choose those virtues. Helps you. So I would, I would definitely do that. And by the way, if you've read one of these books, like Opa, I find myself jumping to the virtue section. What, what, is, what does he say about integrity? What does integrity actually mean? How does this really apply? Oh, I see. And every time I read it, I discover something new that can improve my life. What's more important than that? This is... Ayn Rand's books are really... I mean, properly taken, I'm not talking about dogmatically taken, but properly understood and thought about and integrated and chewed are really guides for living a good life. Politics, you're not going to make a difference. I'm not going to make a difference. I can stand here yelling at Donald Trump all day long, and it doesn't make a difference. Nobody cares. I mean, maybe five people care. It doesn't matter. But you know what? I can make a small improvement tomorrow in my thinking, in my understanding of the objectivist, uh, objectivist ethics that will improve my life immediately and for the next 40 years. I'm assuming I've got 40 years left to live. It's good to be optimistic about some things. Right? All right, we got another call. We'll see if I can, we'll see if I can make it out. Hi, you're on the Iran Book Show. Who's this? Hi, Yaron. This is George speaking. Hey, George. How are you? I'm doing excellent. Thank you. Good. I appreciate you talking about this topic. It's very... Um, returning to the idea of this as not being easy, um, I think the fact that from people who have misunderstood being selfish is just doing what you want. Yep. But this is being the case. Putting theory into practice on a consistent basis uh, is just very, very a process. So, my question is how we apply these principles on a regular basis because it's just easy to kind of slip. You want to be a musician, practice piano every day, yep. day off, and then if you make a practice of taking days off, can you see if you can formulate a short question because you're breaking up so I'm missing half of the words so unfortunately it's awful today see if you can and this was the day where I wanted to actually have a conversation with you guys so I apologize see if you can I think I get the gist of what you're asking but see if you can formulate it quickly uh, in a nutshell how do we these virtues in our, in our life. Okay. So it's easy to slip on these. 
Yeah, no, I think it is easy to slip, and it's easy to slip in our thinking. And I, and I want to get, and I do want to get to politics in a bit because I think I think I see the slippage so much there, partially because, um, I, I don't know all you guys, but I see you posting on Facebook, and I see people posting on Twitter, and I see people referring to different issues, and and they tend to be talking about politics. I see the slippage there, but yeah, it's very easy to slip, and and the thing to do is. To be rational about it, to think about it. So, what the virtues require uh, a serious study. I mean, really serious study, really to try to understand them and to think about situations in your own life and how they apply and to constantly integrate them into your thinking. And then, in practice, in, during, while living them, identify situations in your own mind. I slipped there. Why did I slip? Because it, because I was afraid. Why was I afraid? You know, do a little psychoanalysis, but it's not psychological. It's philosophical. You know, fear, emotions are not tools of cognition. Emotions are not guides to living. If I care about my long-term life, I shouldn't let fear stop me from doing X, Y, and Z. I'm not going to do that again. So it's about constantly thinking about what you're doing, right? It's it's, it's the same with the. Uh, with, with getting good at anything. You mentioned piano playing. She played the piano, and uh, and I don't know, there, there's a certain passage that's really hard for you. So you, you, you practice that in particular, or, there's a, or you try to figure out why is that hard for me? What am I not conceiving of right? I, I shouldn't talk about playing piano because I know nothing about it. Um, I'll talk about teaching, right? Okay, so, so I remember, you know, so I would teach. I teach finance or something like that. And there would be sections where I'd go, while I was teaching, in my head I would go, I don't really know what I'm doing here. I'm just, I'm just, I'm just like parroting what I, what I read in the book. I'm not really teaching these kids anything. I'm just telling them stuff. And then I, I would really get upset because, like, no, I'm, I'm supposed to be good at this, right? I'm a teacher. And I would go back to my office and I'd figure it out. And I'd say, I need to really understand this. And I need to come up with original examples. And I need to come up with new ways of explaining this. And I can't just mimic the book. And I'd figure it out. And the next time I teach it, taught it, I'd be much better. Right? So you're going to make mistakes. You're going to make moral mistakes. You're going to make mistakes with people. You're going to make mistakes with yourself. You're going to violate the morality once in a while because altruism is so ingrained in us. It's so ingrained in the culture. It's so everywhere that it's hard. So what you need to do is think about it. When you notice yourself doing something where you're not exactly sure if it's the right thing, follow it through, follow the lines of thought, try to try to analyze it, tell yourself, I'm not going to do that again, because look, what I did was altruistic. What I did was not in the pursuit of my own flourishing. These are the long term consequences. This is not good. I need to improve myself. And if you constantly do that, you will ultimately automate it. Now, it's still true that when you encounter new situations, you'll have to often rethink certain things. But there's no alternative. That's, it's hard. In, in the sense that life is hard, in the sense that thinking is hard, and to live well, you need to think. Right? So that's, those are all connected. They're all the same thing, right? Life is complicated. It's complex. Thinking in terms of 40 years into the future is hard. So many variables, so many factors. Condensing, in a sense, right? Generalizing into fundamental principles makes it easier. But then applying those principles, not always easy. But the more practice you get, the better you become at it. And you just have to hold the principles and challenge yourself. But every time you violate it, analyze it, and commit yourself to not doing it again. And, and remember that you're going you're gonna to have psychological pulls in the other direction. And you're going to have a tendency, I see this all the time, I see it in myself, I see it in everybody, to rationalize. What does it mean to rationalize? Come up with false, detached from reality explanations for why what you did was okay. Because you don't want to challenge yourself. But the tug of collectivism, the tug of altruism, the tug of wanting to fit in, 
the tug of everything we've been taught since we were zero years old over and over and over again is always going to be there, unfortunately, until we have a, 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 a more integrated objectivist culture where the schools and everything, how it's integrated. As long as that's not the case, you have stuff inside your subconscious that you were taught to believe when you were eight years old that is going to mess you up once in a while. And you have to fight it. You have to be conscious of it. You have to deal with it. And you're going to make mistakes. You're going to make mistakes. And you can't beat yourself up when you make mistakes. You just have to learn from those mistakes. So, yeah, I mean, it, it is it is hard. But that's, again, this is why one of the ways I think to deal with it is to study the ideas and to refresh yourself with the ideas every few months, years, whatever, depending on where you are in life. Refresh, refresh, refresh. Because every time you refresh those ideas, they get better integrated. Uh, and, and remember not to think about, not to think about, um, I, you know, I go back to this. The, we spend way too much time on politics. And way too little time on this stuff. This is what matters. And if we could change enough people's minds about morality, politics wouldn't matter anymore. Everything would fall into place nicely. And if we don't change people's ideas about morality, it doesn't matter how much you do in politics. It doesn't matter. So somebody on the chat is suggesting that I become Secretary of State, right? Or, or Joe Sanders becomes President. No, Pellegrino is president, right? It won't matter. It won't matter. It, 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 it can't make a difference. Because if I as president said, okay, we're doing away with Medicare, we're phasing it out, within a generation there'll be no Medicare, there'd be riots in the streets. You think Berkeley was violent? I mean, you can't do it. The world won't accept it. It's way too early for an objectivist to win political office, the world is fundamentally altruistic out there. And, and you see it even in the way objectivists discuss political issues. Right? Oh, I, st I still see on Facebook and everywhere, I see people writing, um, oh no, uh, uh, you know, trade is bad because uh, those, uh, those Mexican free trade zones, they're taking our jobs away from us. What are our jobs? What are our jobs? Our jobs, wh whose jobs? There is no our jobs. There's my job and there's your job. And I read something on Twitter today that says somebody can take my job. Come and get it, right? I love competition. Come and get it. If you can take my job, you deserve it. You deserve it. Good for you. I don't resent that. If somebody can do my job better than I can, good for them. I'll find something else to do. I'm not, I'm not, you know, my self-interest is not in using government force to save my job. That would be bizarre. Right? If we believe, again, in principles, so I'm going to skip a bunch of stuff in morality, right, and say that we have come to the agreement, right, based on the objectives to ethics, that individual rights must be protected, and that is the job of government. Oh, but wait a minute. I'm going to lose my job if we have more trade. Um, and that would be, that would be unselfish of me, right? Because losing a job is not selfish. So I want them to violate rights just in this one case. That's not selfishness. That's dropping the entire context of your entire morality. It's dropping the context of your entire life to focus on one concrete, in-the-moment thing. This is exactly the opposite of what Ayn Rand selfishness is all about. It's about... I know selfish is about making your life the best that it can be. And the only way to make your life the best that it can be is to live is in a free society. And once you agree to violate somebody's rights, once you've basically agreed to the violation of the principle of a free society, so you've succumbed, you've accepted the idea that a free society shouldn't exist, which is counter to your self-interest. So some, there's a contradiction. And the contradiction is, it was never in your self-interest to violate somebody's rights to keep a job, for example. It's your self-interest to live in a free society 
in which people compete. And yes, you might get fired one day because somebody overseas does a better job than you can doing what you do or whatever. Or that some immigrant comes in and takes your job because they're better at it than you are. Or they're cheaper, more efficient at it than you are. Your responsibility is then to figure out what to do next with your life. It's nobody else's responsibility to retrain you. It's nobody else's responsibility to figure out what to do for you, how to take care of you. It's your responsibility. And if you want, in the world we live in today, in the mixed economy we live in today, where jobs are being lost because of government regulations, because of taxes, and yes, by, by default, because of trade and because of immigration, then it's your job to demand that the government stop regulating and stop taxing so that more jobs are created so you have more opportunities. Not the opposite. Not to build barriers so other people can't come so that you're protected. Again, that's not selfish. Selfishness is not, is not momentary it's about principles it's not momentary it's not what what will what will make you feel good in the moment it's not what will save your job for you what is selfish is to live in a political system in which people will compete for your job that's the best thing for you it means your standard of living is going to be higher because there's going to be competition and new people coming in and new ideas being produced and free trade would generate higher standard of living for for you and yeah, it means you will have to work harder. You will have to retrain yourself. You will have to be constantly, constantly pursuing new opportunities and new skills and new knowledge. Yes, you will have to live. Live. The nice thing about capitalism is in some senses it forces people. Forces the wrong word. It incentivizes people to live, to use their minds. In other words, it incentivizes people to be virtuous. This is why capitalism is, is in a sense, kind of self-perpetuating if we had the right moral system. By following the virtues, you do well under capitalism, and capitalism will reward you for following the virtues. And if you are not virtuous, if you're not rational, in other words, then you will not be rewarded by capitalism and that provide you with an incentive to figure out what works, which means how can you become rational? So you see it's a self-reinforcing morality and economics, morality and politics when they are based on a proper principle of human individual life are self-reinforcing and are beautiful things. All right. Um, we can take, I guess, another call if, if, if somebody wants to call 347-324-3075, 347-324-3075. I want to look at this article by, um, on, on Bill Gates, this interview with Bill Gates, uh, where he is arguing for a tax on robots, right? Robots are taking human jobs, and Bill Gates believes that government should tax companies' use of them as a way to at least temporarily slow the spread of automation and to fund other types of employment. Right? And, and what, does he want, what does he want done with the tax money? What he wants done with the tax money is to spend it on those kind of jobs that are uniquely human. What are those jobs? Taking care of poor people and taking care of old people and teaching kids in schools. And why is he concerned about this tax? Because, and, and he actually says here, that he believes that we should slow down innovation because innovation is going to take away jobs like truck drivers and cleaners, I guess. And there were a number of examples here, but drivers were a big one because of self-driving cars, right? Robots are going to replace us, and we should slow down that innovation. Why? Because there's a whole group of people out there who we shouldn't let be responsible for their own future, but we need to decide for them that they can cope with this change and therefore we need to slow it down and then government needs to be involved and the government needs to enter in order to protect them from this change by giving them new jobs or by training them. 
And if you want to see the power of philosophy, if you want to see the power of ideas, go read this Bill Gates interview, right? It's all about altruism. It's all about collectivism. We, 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 we have these jobs. These jobs are going to be replaced by some people. We need to take care of those people. There are no individuals here. No individuals here. Yeah, and, and you know, so let's slow things down. Now, forget about principles, right? Forget about the principle of, of uh, you know, the free market's work and where free markets are left alone. People find jobs. Every time in history, talk about induction. Every time in history, technology has entered. There's been no unemployment. Quite the contrary, right? Quite the contrary. Think about, think about the disruptive nature of the automobile industry. Or think about the disruptive nature of the first uh, automatic weaving machines. He thinks self-driving cars are disruptive? He has no clue what he's talking about. Think about the disruptive nature of, of mass agriculture, uh, automated agriculture. I mean, we went from 90% of all people working in agriculture to less than 1%. How do we do that? I don't, I don't get it. Where, where are those 99%? They must have all died of starvation. Can't think in principles. So there's no principle here. Right? And then it's the idea of, ooh, people are going to lose their job. There's no way they can take care of themselves. There's no way they can figure out what to do. We shouldn't lobby government or, or try to influence government to reduce regulation, reduce taxes, so companies can create new jobs for these people, increase wealth in society generally, so there's more jobs and more things for people to do. God forbid we do any of that. Oh, no, we need to take care of them. We, we, society, need to take care of them because they, as individuals, cannot take care of themselves. It's complete and utter motivation through altruism. And this is, this is the point. Bill Gates, to the extent that he was successful in Microsoft, was a rational, selfish human being. And as a consequence, was unbelievably successful. But he can't hold it. He can't hold it because he has not accepted. I don't know if he's familiar, but certainly has not accepted. He's not accepted a, uh, the morality of selfishness. He still holds the morality of altruism. And the morality of altruism is chipping away at it. Now, when he was young and hungry and poor, relatively poor, he was driven. And he was driven by reason, by rationality. He was driven to be successful. He loved it. But as he got wealthier, and plus he's been kicked out of Microsoft, so he doesn't really have a job, right? The government kicked him out, basically. I mean, he left voluntarily, but the government made it untenable, really, for him to be able to do a creative job at Microsoft. Since now he's kind of not busy, all of the philosophical premises that his parents taught him, and a Warren Buffett preaches to him regularly when they play bridge, bubbling up to the surface. And you're seeing the altruism come out and reason decline. He can't think anymore. Literally can't think. Really, this is what technology does? It causes people to lose jobs and without government intervention? Again, where are all those people? Where are they? Who died because they lost their jobs and there was no benevolent government to help them 100 years ago, 150, 200 years ago. So philosophy is powerful. Ethics is powerful. And you have to get it when you're young. And you have to reinforce it daily, constantly, all the time. And practice it on your political debates. Practice it in your political debates. Whenever you have, whenever you're tempted to say um, it's good for the economy, stop and think about it. Are you using it's good for the economy in an individualistic, selfish sense of the effect it has on individuals? Or are you using it in the collectivistic sense? So somebody, somebody uh, said, what if, uh, what if Trump does 
all these good things. And the economy booms and everything's, everything's successful, right? The economy's doing well. And my argument is that none of that will matter long term if he does it in the name of collectivism. Quite the opposite. What will that do? That will reaffirm people's belief that collectivism is a good thing. And look, it produces good results. It produces good results. So is it good for the economy? Well, I can think of things that might be good for the economy short run, maybe even in the medium run, but that are against individual rights and that therefore destroy us long term. Um, this is, uh, people will lose their jobs. So what? I mean, every time you make some of these political arguments, right? Think about, you know, I want to cut taxes because it'll spur economic growth. Well, is that really the reason you want to cut taxes? Is it? I want to cut taxes because I want to return the money to the people from whom it belongs to. I want to reduce the amount of stealing that goes on in our economy. I want to cut regulation because I want to lift the burden off of the producers. I want to cut regulation so that I can free up the human mind, the individual human mind. And yes, the consequence of that is the growing economy, but that is not the primary. The primary is what impact do these things have on the individual? Are they violating individual rights? Yes, so they should be gone. Oh, yeah, and it has a good effect on the economy. Practice, practice, practice. Practice applying principles, not in an out-of-context, rationalistic, dogmatic way, but in your own thinking and in the way you express yourself online and other places. Taxes are violation of rights. So you want to reduce them. You want to minimize them. You're probably not to zero because we can't get there anytime soon. But the lower the better from that perspective. But from the economic perspective, actually, unless you cut spending, it doesn't have much of an impact. Well, if Dodd Frank, for example, is eliminated for a bad reason, then that bad reason, for example, collectivism or uh, national, uh, what is it, uh, uh, um, nationalism, then, and it has positive results, then nationalism and collectivism get the credit. And then for every dot Frank that is eliminated, you'll get 5,000 new uh, violations of individual rights in the name of the nationalism or collectivism. On net, you're a loser. On net, you're a loser every single time. When, Donald, when, when Ronald Reagan lowered taxes in the name of spurring economic growth, then they were raised immediately afterwards. And it didn't matter. It made no difference. When regulations were somewhat loosened on banks in the 1990s, and then you had to fight for the wrong reasons, and then you had a financial crisis, who got blamed? The wrong reasons. Banks got blamed, and you got massive new regulations. The reasons matter. They matter more than the action itself. More than the action itself. I'd prefer a president who only got half the stuff done, but did that half stuff for the right reason, than a president that got a lot of the stuff done all for the wrong reason. It's the reasons that survive. It's the reasons that animate what will happen in the future again. This is what I'm trying to get through, right? To really be selfish means to think long term it means to take everything into account not the, just the immediate impact on your life but the whole impact in your on your life over the long run all right now i mean the selfishness topic we could go on and on about it because there are a lot of fallacies out there the, the, the fallacy that we're automatically selfish everybody's selfish right no Selfishness is an achievement. You have to figure out what's good for you, just like you have to figure out what good food is and what bad food is, and we're still not sure exactly what an appropriate diet in the modern world is. It's hard to figure out what actions, what values, what virtues are good for you and which, are not, which, which values are bad for you. It requires figuring out, 
really thinking about it, it's a huge, huge achievement. So every one of these things, nothing, nothing out there is going to be simple in terms of applying this. It has to be thought through. Again, your life as the standard value for 40, 50, 60 years, the complexity of what happens, it's not simple. It's not simple. You, you, you know, if you don't want to lose your job, even for the future of freedom, so in other words, what you're saying to yourself is, I would rather have this job and live in a free country, then you're not being selfish. You don't understand what selfishness is. You don't get, you don't get it. You don't get life. You don't get what flourishing life is. Life is not about a job, not about any particular job. Even if it was, even if, no, it is an alternative. Absolutely, it could be an alternative. You, you, you could face a situation where you could either keep your job, but raise barriers to enter, entry and reduce freedom, or the other way around. Lose your job because you have advocated for lowering barriers of entry for more people competing with you. I'd say you're not selfish if you vote for raising the barriers. And that's fine. You, you, you know, you can live an altruistic life or you can live a thoughtless life. The, uh, the options are not selfish, altruistic. There's also a third option, which is thoughtless or self-destructive. And, and choosing your job over freedom is self-destructive. It's not being selfish. But that's why I said selfishness properly understood, is a massive achievement, and it requires consistency. And I see very, very few people actually being able to hold this and use it consistently in how they argue. And I see myself slip into this all the time, using collectivistic, even altruistic premises in the way I argue for things. Right? In the way I argue for things. So, encourage everybody... The positive value of today, right, is to go read Opa, particularly in the context of today, the chapters on the good and on virtue. What's the chapter after virtue? I think it's happiness, right? Three chapters, the good, virtue, and happiness. I mean, nothing will do more to make your life better uh, and, and, uh, than that. I mean, I'm not going to... Certainly it's going to be better. Um, it's going to be better than uh, writing another post on politics. So Tim is asking, self-sacrificial job loss for an unknown future. No, no. Again, principles, you have to be able to think in principles. It's not an issue of an unknown future. It's an issue of the principle of freedom versus unfreedom. The principle of, am I defending individual rights or not defending? If you understand the principle, that defending individual rights is crucial to your life, then you will never be tempted to advocate for a position that is anti-individual rights. And you would never view losing a job in that context as sacrificial. It's not sacrificial. I don't believe in sacrifice. But the, but the, greater, the greater value is protecting individual rights, the principle of individual rights, than any particular job. Now, it's a sad state of the world that we have to be in a position where those can even be at odds. But that's the state of the world in which we find us, ourselves. And for an objectivist to advocate for violating individual rights on others in order to keep his own job means he doesn't understand, in my view, the morality, the morality of selfishness properly. All right, we've got, we got another caller. We'll see if we can... Uh, hi, you're in the Iran book show? Sure. Oh wow! I can barely hear you. See if you can see if you can really speak up and quickly because you're all choppy. Yeah, can, can you hear me? Yes, but but make it quick because it, it, it's so choppy. I can't understand every other word. Okay. Um, altruism seems to be um, common in many cultures. Um, you see it in Buddhism, you see it in uh, and Confucianism. Yep. Just curious, what what why is all this? Why is it so so common 
Yeah, that's a great question. In history. Yeah, it's a great question. So why is, why is altruism so common in so many different cultures? Why is it so common? You know, you go back to primitive tribes, you go every religion, um, with the exception of Greece and the Enlightenment, altruism has been the dominant morality all over the world in every, in every culture, really. And, and I think it really, um, it, it goes back to two, two ideas, two things. One, that reason is a massive human achievement. And reason is an attribute of the individual, only individual's reason. But the identification of that is very hard. So man at the perceptual level, man who's not thinking and, and, uh, and conceptualizing and really uh, a thinker, which I think man wasn't doing that much thinking, unfortunately, because they didn't have the tools. They didn't know how for probably tens of thousands of years. Um, still needed guidance. They needed some kind of guidance from somebody on how to live a life. And it was easier just to get it as authority. And so altruism was what the authority will always, what an authority will always present to you. So authorities who want to rule, um, use altruism in order to rule. So think about it, you know, if, if you're in a tribe and uh, you've got all these people in a tribe and, they, and they, they're starting to think for themselves and they're starting to do their own thing, and I'm, I'm kind of the ruler. And I've been the ruler for, I don't know, my family's been ruling this tribe for a thousand years. And, but now people are starting to think and they're discovering a little bit of science and maybe the beginnings of maybe agriculture or tool making or whatever it is, whatever phase in human beings it was. And I go, wait a minute, you know, this, is, this isn't good. I'm going to lose my power. I, I want to preserve my power. Let, let, me, let me see if I can, you know, they're really searching. They're searching for meaning. And uh, I can give them meaning. And the meaning is the tribe. And I can anoint my pal over here to be the witch doctor, and he can tell them, uh, he can channel the tribe, the tribe's needs. And he can tell them what the tribe wants and what the tribe requires. And it's a till in the witch doctor, Ayn Rand, uh, in, in, uh, for the New Intellectual, talks about this. Coming together and telling people and, and using force, this is what you should live for. And here are the rules, and here are the principles, here are the commandments, and we talk to God. You don't. We talk to God. And this is what God says. And you can tell human beings at the very early stages of cognition are struggling with this, and they don't quite get science, and there are floods, and, and there's weird weather, and there's all of these strange things happening around them, and they don't have explanations to them, and looking, and religion is a great explanation. And the religious authorities are always going to say, you've got to live for the tribe because they don't want them to live for themselves. And for that matter, given that they don't have full cognizant of their own cognition, I'm not sure they can live for themselves completely at that point. So there's, there's this strong incentive to, to, to come together in the tribe, to stick together, to do what you're told, uh, and the rulers have an incentive, and the religious leaders have an incentive to perpetuate that. And then come the Greeks, and the Greeks, in a sense, challenge that. How do they challenge that? By asking questions. What explains the world? What are the basic con constituents of the world? You know, fire, water, whatever. Whatever the explanations are, some of them, were, looking back, seem pretty dumb. But they were starting to ask questions. They were starting to become human in the fullest sense. They were starting to ask questions and discover ways to generate truths and they were discovering that they could actually explain things and they were discovering that people could actually think for themselves and ask questions for themselves and answer and you could do a dialogue and you could you could discuss philosophical ideas and difficult ideas with people in the streets because anybody could think and and the whole idea of individualism the whole idea of reason comes out of that but that's a massive human achievement and for them, for the Greeks, to live for somebody else, I mean, they would ask why. I mean, even Plato and Socrates would ask why. And of course, they'd have to invent an afterworld and so on. And Aristotle would come and come around and say, well, no, you, you, you don't have to live for the group. It, it, 
that that's meaningless. Why? Right? So you have to add the Greeks. And then unfortunately, unfortunately, the Greeks didn't have all a fully, you know, full philosophy for whatever reason. Aristotle failed to really ignite in the culture and that and Christianity ultimately fills that gap and and you know Christianity and and in other cultures Chinese in India and other places never had Greece so they never got this flowering of the idea of reason and the idea of individualism and I think that is why that is fundamentally why you never got China Chinese culture always reached a certain point and then declined and would reach a certain point and then decline but it never broke through the way Western culture did in the in the 18th and 19th centuries until until recently. And it never broke through because now this is me completely speculating, because they didn't have the concept of reason. And as a consequence of that, they didn't really have the concept of individualism. And without those two concepts, you cannot break through as a culture, as a civilization. So they remained at the level of Confucius. They remained at the level of Christianity. They, you know, and only now are they learning from the West the ideas. Only now are they learning from the West the ideas of individualism and reason over the last 30, 40, 50 years. And as a consequence, they're breaking through, they're exploding, they're doing well because they've learned these ideas. They, couldn't, they didn't generate them from within. They had to import them. That's our biggest export, the West, is, is ideas. And uh, these are the most important exports. And this is why places like Japan and China and Korea, South Korea and everywhere in Asia is doing well because they've recognized to one level or another, right? Not fully, not from an objective perspective, but to some, one extent or another. The value of individualism, the value of an individual, the political systems are starting to reflect that. Only starting, right? There's a long way to go. And, and their economic system is starting to reflect that. And, of course, the value of reason and science and innovation and all of that, they're starting to, they've discovered what the West discovered in Greece originally and then rediscovered during the Enlightenment, and we are a product of. All right, so there you go. Um, go study. Uh, be selfish. Be truly selfish, which means... Go read up about selfishness. That's the best way you can be selfish, is to read up about selfishness. We'll periodically keep coming back to this topic. There's a lot to talk about. I think originally I thought I'd do an episode in each one of the virtues, and, and we're going to get back to that. We'll do that. I want to I wanna go back to making these more philosophical. I also want to see if people listen to them, if I make them more philosophical. The, the shows that get the most listens to are the ones on like the Muslim ban and on alt-right and on Donald Trump. So um, if, if you want more shows like this that are maybe a little bit more philosophical, then you got to share them more. You got to tweet them more. You got to Facebook them more. You got to get the word out there so we get the viewership up so I get incentivized to do more shows like this versus the more political shows that, you know, if I do a show Milo, it'll probably, you know, which I'm thinking of doing, uh, lots of people will, will, will listen to it. But is that the most value we can get? No, probably not. Probably not. All right. Have a great rest of your weekend. Have a great week. I'll be here. We go back to Saturday next week. And after that, who knows what my schedule is going to be because I'm going to be traveling all over the place. Um, oh, oh, I wanted to pitch a, a few events before we go, before we go, before we go. Two events. February 25th, and if you're in Southern California, you got to come to an ARI event, Building a Future of Reason and Capitalism. It's, a, it's a, in Costa Mesa, California. It's a kind of a n northern part of Orange County, so you can come down from L.A., come up from San Diego. If you're in Orange County, go, go to the ari.einrand.org events and, and click on it, and you can sign up. Then in Chicago, now we got a bunch of speakers of this one, Steve Simpson, Aaron Smith, Don Watkins, Jim Brown, the new CEO of ARI, and Chris Locke, a relatively new VP of marketing and communication. And then on March 11th, uh, in Chicago, we'll be doing another one of these, Building a Future of Reason and Capitalism, with Jonathan Honing. He's going to be there. 
that's going to be a blast. And me, Aaron Smith, Elon Juno, and Don Watkins, it'll be a lot of fun. So you should be there. Uh, that's in Chicago. I'm going to be in London the week after next for a week, not doing any public events, but doing a lot of events at high schools. I'll, I'll talk a little bit about that next Saturday. I'll be in Bogota, Colombia in two and a half weeks. Uh, if any of you listening from Colombia, I hope to see you in Bogota. And I'll be in Denver for Leadership Program of the Rockies and a number of events there. And um, I think that's it. All right. Have a great rest of the weekend and see you, talk to you all Saturday. Don't forget to pitch the show, tweet, Facebook, email. Let people know that if they want to know about selfishness, this is the show they should listen to. Bye.